I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. Thanks for tuning in today. I know you guys have been enjoying a lot of the ballistic study podcast that we've been doing going all the way back. You know, now we're probably six months removed, uh, starting in on that history of the study of ballistics and going through internal and external and uh, different, you know, BCs and uh, point mass solvers versus the modified point mass stuff and then uh, getting into dispersion. Man, we covered a lot of ground and the, the feedback has been good. I would say largely the feedback has been positive. Not all of it's been positive and we knew there was going to be some pushback and that's okay. Um, you know, that's good for people to question things and uh, the engaged listener um, has, has sent a lot of questions in. So today across the table, I've got two of our favorite guests here on the show, Project Engineer Miles Neville, Senior Ballistician Jaden Quinlan. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Yep, no yeah. problem. So, like I mentioned, not all of these questions and comments that have come pouring in are positive. Some of them more uh, with some reservation. Some of them just want some clarity. But today, I brought you guys in here. I've got episode 57, which is the Dispersion Podcast. Episode 54, which is with uh, living legend in the ballistics world, Jeff Seward. And then episode 52, where we kind of recapped some of our um, – your groups are too small, uh, questions and follow-ups. So I've got comments and questions that came in from those episodes, uh, here today, and we're going to go over them and address the, the questions and the concerns and some of the just statements, just give our, our two cents to them. Um, you know, the listeners out there responded big with these episodes, emails coming into podcast at hornady.com, tons of comments here down below in the YouTube, um, just all great stuff. And before we get in there uh, to these questions, I mentioned this on a few episodes ago, but man, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not subscribed, please subscribe. It doesn't cost you a dime and it does us, does us a world of good uh, in just the numbers, the analytics, having more people see these podcasts, and then it helps justify our existence as uh, an employee. So it, <laughs> it, does, uh, it helps everybody. So if you're listening, please subscribe, tell a friend about it. And without further ado, we're going to start with episode 57, which we're, we talked about dispersion mm -hmm. and what factors influence bullet dispersion. And there's a ton of nuance to this. And there are some things that create a lion's share of the dispersion. And then there's some small things that maybe or may not account for very, very small amounts of dispersion. But we're going to go through and hit a couple of those questions. So uh, the first one here comes to us from the YouTube's Sage Creek Gus. Uh, he says, very good presentation on the factors that cause dispersion up into where the bullet leaves the barrel. I hope you're planning on another presentation on the factors that contribute to the bullet dispersion after it leaves the muzzle and gets to the target. So, guys, uh, uh, not necessarily a question, more of just a comment, but if you could address that, the factors that cause dispersion once it leaves the muzzle. Yeah, I think we kind of covered a lot of those concepts in the external external ballistics podcast. I don't remember what those numbers were. In the 40s, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, your main stuff is velocity variation is going to cause vertical, um, you know, change in time of flight. It's going to cause change in exposure to gravity. It's easy to, you know, uh, see that that would cause different point of impacts vertically on target. Uh, wind, obviously, is at play all the time. That's yeah. going to cause differences not only, Blasted you know, wind. horizontally left to right, but also vertically mm -hmm. uh, with the aerodynamic jump uh, aspect of it. Well, there's vertical winds, too. Yeah, vertical winds too. Yeah, which uh, just rotate the reference frame and it does the same thing. Um, and then uh, drag, drag. Yeah, your drag varies a little bit, shot to shot, um, because of a whole bunch of different things. I don't think we'll get into on on this, but uh, yeah. So that, that's you know the the dispersion stuff is really step one. Um, it can be additive. So a common question is, <clears throat> can you shoot a smaller group at longer range than you can at closer range? And the answer is technically you can, however, it's not the same group. Um, so it is possible to have your uh, high velocity shot be the 
dispersion wise it would be the lowest shot in the group and those two things cancel each other out and maybe that one hits in the middle at long distance so you can have these all these different contributing factors can be additive or subtractive they can all work in alignment with each other in one direction say high or low or right or left mm-hmm. um, and they can also cancel each other out and it's kind of just a mixed bag it it goes back to that that combinations calculator comment that we made you know that you're you're dealing with a whole bunch of different variables and which ones of those you get uh, you don't it's really arbitrary. know, you right. know. So yeah, that's part of it. Yes. On that on that note, there's a thing called positive compensation that people talk about. Um, oh yeah, and with muzzle where, brakes um, or whatever. It's yeah. where you try to like tune a load or tune the system so that you're forcefully make your high your high velocity shot be the low in the dispersion and your vice versa. Your low mm-hmm. velocity shots be high so that at some distance downrange the two come together and you get tighter groups at that distance. Um, and I looked into that with quite a bit of effort and some of the early testing that I did, um, just uh, analyzing the dispersion. And this is, um, I don't know, probably two or 3,000 rounds worth of data. Uh, and it's like, and everything that I did, whether, so I guess what I'm getting at is that tuning the load to get positive compensation, I never saw anything. It's pretty much an exact 50-50 split of whether your high velocity mm-hmm. shots go high or low. Um, yep. Yeah. And then that's only one act factor of it because then you've got some drag from one shot to the next mm-hmm. so by the time you get 800 yards down range if you had the highest velocity mm-hmm. shot with the highest drag or the lowest drag it's gonna yeah there may yeah there may be some mechanical thing you could do to the shape of the barrel to make it do something funky but uh, as far as uh tuning it with load not development i i'm not gonna say you can't but uh i don't believe in it Roger personally that. We've talked about doing the hit probability subject at some point. That that pretty much answers that question. Mm-hmm. You know, how do all those things add up to each other to give you the the net result? Right, right yeah. on. And that's and again with small small samples, you'll see that you can cancel things out and and technically they can. But uh, odds are against that, and most of the time, all if when you get a big enough sample of shots, the dispersion is pretty linear for a while, and then just slowly increases and mm-hmm. how the rate at which it grows as mm-hmm. it goes down range all right sage creek gus there you go jump back into the uh, archives here and listen to those two podcasts about external ballistics that'll cover the lion's share of uh, dispersion increasing factors once the bullet leaves the muzzle uh, moving on to tom longbow he has a question when you drilled the cx and marked them and loaded them at 12 3 6 and 9 o'clock did you notice that the groups were placed at a 90-degree delay? Greetings from Germany. Yes, absolutely. That's an interesting observation. Um, he must have uh, had some experience with uh, CG offset and how it works. So mm-hmm. what he's asking is, uh, you know, when we drilled the holes in those, actually, Miles, you drilled the holes in those things. He's a machinist. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he's asking, you know, when we oriented the drilled hole uh, where the imbalance was caused, when we put that up at 12 o'clock at the top, did we notice that the response of that was 90 degrees, you know, either to the right or to the left? Yep. The answer is yes, absolutely. So the ones that were oriented at 12 o'clock ended up at 3 o'clock, and the ones that were oriented at 3 went to 6. 6 and, and, six yeah, and, and wow. And worked their way around. Yep. That's pretty cool. All right, Kenny V, I love all the knowledge being shared. Um, what going to like, okay, I got a new gun. How do I get the most out of it? Do you start reloading from round one? with beginner knowledge or start with factory ammunition and learn your rifle again thanks all the way from belgium so what he's asking is uh walk through the steps of hey right i just got this new rifle how do i get the most out of it do you start reloading out of the gate do you do some initial work with factory ammunition um what do you do to get the most out of it boy i think either way you want to take it i don't think there's a a wrong way the only way you're going to understand how good or bad this rifle is is to to shoot it yeah you know, to got to establish a baseline yeah yeah um, factory ammo is a great way to do it but yeah i think so um as as far as like brand new barrel to some rounds on it uh, we've seen some inconsistent things maybe in the first 20 rounds yeah depending on the barrel heavily dependent on the barrel yeah. um, these higher quality match barrels that we uh, use the majority of the time in most of our testing they don't seem to suffer from it much meaning that there's not much change from the very first round onto the barrel to the 20th or 50th maybe but some factory barrels um, we have seen that happen with yeah mm, okay um, yeah th- yeah and if you're uncomfortable behind the rifle because it's a whole new system to you then that might be i guess it, what i'm getting if you're if you're the limiting 
source of the dispersion and you're going to get better as you keep shooting more rounds, then you should level that off before you start testing. For sure. That, that sounds, that's sage advice regardless of what you're doing. And I think for me, especially early on, I always like to start with a baseline of factory ammo. Uh, usually 100 rounds was kind of the generic, you know, you get 100 rounds in a new barrel or a new rifle or whatever it is. And you take those 100 rounds, one, to establish the baseline of what it's capable of with this particular load. And typically I would try to do it with something that's known to be, you know, accurate, say 6.5 Creedmoor, 140 mm -hmm. grain ELD match factory ammo. Uh, that is the gold standard or 168 grain match bullet with 308 Winchester. Mm -hmm. Just something that's tried and true. Um, establish the baseline and then you get a little little stash of fired brass for you to start uh, mm -hmm. reloading with when you were really want to dial it in. And then from there, yeah, obviously jump into a hand load. But I think to say it again, establish the baseline and use that baseline with a good representative sample of what the rifle's capable of, and then use that as your benchmark as you start hand loading. Yep. All right, from Mick Dackery. That seems like a made-up name. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I feel like a whole episode should be done on how the ballisticians take care of the barrels that they test with. Break it and processes, if any, overcleaning. Not cleaning enough. Is the barrel burnout from overcleaning a thing? Or maybe no cleaning at all? So, yeah, guys, that's a great question. We haven't addressed it. And Jaden and I, I know we've talked about having uh, kind of the lead uh, lab technician down there on the podcast to just mm -hmm. go over some of this stuff. So, uh, guys, walk us through the ballistician's take on taking care of a barrel, a new barrel, what it looks like, maintenance phases, and then, you know, the overcleaning thing, and if it you can ruin a barrel by overcleaning or not cleaning at all. Yeah, well, I think you get the biggest change in a barrel when it goes from an unfired state to a fired state. You know, you're, um, you're going to change uh, the, the internal conditions of the barrel bore from a roughness or a burr standpoint you know if anything's left in there from rifling i think you went into that in a lot more detail on that custom rifle podcast um but as far as how we do it i mean we you've probably heard the term listen to the barrel mm -hmm. i mean that's what i do i listen to it both in the way it's cleaning and then i also try to monitor at least velocity uh, and if I can, velocity and pressure, you know, if I'm working with a pressure and velocity barrel. And typically what I'll see is with, with the high quality barrels that we use, the the single point cut, you know, uh, the Bartlands, the proof is the proofs, the HSs, there's a bunch of them out there, yeah. you know. Um, we see that those don't really have much of a break into them at all. And, and what I mean by that is I'll watch the velocity and I'll watch the pressure. And it's, re you know, after one, two or three or four shots or something, it's really not changing much after that. Those three or four, it seems to change quite a bit from shot one to shot two to shot three but usually in that single digit number of shots that thing has stabilized and it just kind of stays there if i keep shooting the same ammo obviously letting it cool maintaining it cleaning you know stuff like that it's not it's not changing rapidly now if i had a barrel that that i i started with those small sample sizes shoot once clean shoot once clean or three or whatever your prescription is that you want to do if that barrel's in a constant state of change it's probably not broke in yet. If the definition of broke in means it's stable now, I mean, mm -hmm. what's the definition of broke in too? You know, that's sure. like this word that's thrown around a lot and it's not well defined. Um, but that's how we do it. We pay attention to the barrel. How's it cleaning? How much uh, copper or carbon does, does it look like is coming out? And what is the velocity and pressure doing as we shoot it? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's a giant, it depends stamp on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, Cartridge dependent, powder dependent, bullet dependent. Oh, yeah. Well, cartridge and, and powder dependent for sure. You know, you start getting into the overbore cartridges, uh, even even something that's not grossly overbore, but like 6.5 PRC, where you've got a really slow burn speed of propellant into a relatively small bore diameter. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah, definitely going to come into play. You can have pressure building up and have problems within 150 rounds yeah. in some, some of the, yeah. Some, it depends. I mean, it just depends. There's some guys you can get away with 300, 500 maybe. And then there's some barrels that we've almost, we, we quit testing early because we got scared. We were blowing primer pockets open at 120 rounds without cleaning it, you know, yeah. and some of the rougher barrels that are out there. So if you, I mean, and then there's just fluke stuff that'll happen. If you get a copper deposit that sticks and starts grabbing more and more copper, then oh, yeah. if you... There's no round count associated with that. That's it's just, just a, thing. Thi a thing that happens, and if you don't address it, it's just going to keep getting yeah. worse. So regarding uh, pressure and velocity barrels, um, maybe this could be part of a separate podcast entirely, but pressure and velocity barrels, we clean pretty religiously. We clean 
effectively. We're not just out there scrubbing the, you know, scrubbing the piss out of them for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we do keep those so that they're in the exact same state when we do a test. Um, So walk us through, you know, what the break in and cleaning procedure is on a pressure barrel. Yeah. Well, one thing that's kind of the tool, the tool that we use to do that is a thing called reference ammunition. Oh yeah. So we have a lot of ammunition that um, after that barrel gets broken and everything is stabilized, we will shoot that reference load of ammunition through that barrel and we can assess it for pressure, velocity, dispersion. Extreme spread. Yep. And get all those numbers. And now you've kind of established, hey, this ammunition is performing like this in this barrel. Then as you continue to use it, you shoot it, you get rounds on it, you clean it, you do whatever changes you've done to the barrel. You can always come, if, you, if you've called into question, is what I've done to this barrel or the way I've cleaned it or whatever, has it changed the barrel? You can take that reference ammunition and come back and test it again. Mm-hmm. And if you do a statistically valid test, when you, when you do those reference checks, you can see if the barrel's shifted or not or changed or not in some way. Um, and so that's one of the, the key ways where we monitor barrels. And we do that, uh, you know, for the, the hand loader or reloader or recreational shooter that isn't measuring pressure and velocity, it's not a bad idea to have a little stash of, of reference ammunition and use it for dispersion or for velocity to assess, you know, the rate of fouling oh, buildup yeah. in your That's barrel. A good point. Um, because like you said, you know, cart- it depends on so many things. There's no set rule to follow with these things. You have to, in my opinion, do it in a more measured way. You need to have a tool that helps you do it. And that's what reference ammunition allows you to do. Um, yep. But as far as the lab barrels, they get cleaned uh, twice a day. You know, if there's any question as to the level of cleanliness of the barrel and its effect on a test, it's not used. I mean, it gets pulled out until that thing is in a stable state. It's not used to assess the performance of ammunition. Right on. And uh, obviously, uh, we talked about the overbore stuff and the really yeah. slow burning. And then, balance. like over cleaning, if you if you clean properly, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, if you don't clean properly, if you don't clean properly, you can create a problem. Uh, yeah, never mix abrasive cleaners and brushes. Mm-hmm. Um, br- bronze brushes or brass brushes or whatever the copper brushes, those are fine as long as you just use solvents or oil or whatever, but don't use abrasive cleaners with those. Uh, the abrasive cleaning thing is one you can, you can use them properly and there's a place for them, but generally we avoid it if we can. Yeah. They're really great for busting carbon. Yeah. Yeah. You got to know what you're doing. Yeah. You, it's very, let's put it this way. It's really, really easy to ruin a barrel with abrasive cleaners. Yeah. I would say it's not really easy to ruin a barrel with a product like wipe out for example yeah. which is a really effective cleaner and you barely have to put a rod in the darn thing yeah mm-hmm. wipe out bortec yep. yeah bortec eliminator yeah those yep. are excellent so yes you absolutely can and if you don't clean a barrel you can ruin a barrel that way too oh, oh yeah yeah because yeah. yeah, there are i've seen in some stress tests in years ago in my former career yeah you do a stress test with something that's burning a pretty full charge of like say reloader 26 Mm -hmm. you end up with a carbon ring that we had to scrub out with diamond compound Mm -hmm. and uh that's that was a ginger process to say the least uh so and bore scopes help a ton Mm -hmm. Uh, not that everybody has a bore scope but there are digital bore scopes now that are getting way more affordable so preston was showing me that i don't know treslong is that it the 40 dollar one it's I'm really, not sure. I don't, I don't know. know. It's incredibly a, affordable, and the image that was coming out of it was pretty impressive for yeah. what it was. So. I'm a caveman, so if I don't see it from you guys, I probably won't see it. That's yeah. true. Well, you yeah. got the old hawk one. Yeah. 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 Which uh, is still a great one. One more point on that, though, um, for cleaning. If you do that reference ammunition as a reloader or hand loader, you keep a little stash of ammo to the side that you know what it does, you can use that to help you with your cleaning process. Let's say your barrel is, like, really fouled up bad. You get done with some matches or whatever, and, and the thing is... 75 to 100 foot per second faster, you know, increased velocity than it was before, you have fouling that's doing that. That that velocity doesn't come for free. It comes yeah. from pressure. Um, and so if you want to try to get that barrel back to the baseline condition, you can use that reference ammo to check how you're cleaning it. So oh, you can sure. go clean it and then check a sample of your reference ammo. Did the velocity move at all? Did it come down 20 foot? Maybe it came down halfway right it gives you a gauge like oh okay by doing this i affected it in this way and so you can use that to more intelligently get your barrel back to the condition you want it in yep great stuff all right there you go mcdackery Mm -hmm. moving on to wyatt graham he says are there bullet manufacturing processes that can lead to a more off center uh or or basically a a more uh 
it's more CG offset, more center of, center of gravity offset. So more so with a bonding process or things of that nature. Um, that's basically what he's asking. Is there certain bullet manufacturing processes that create a more uh, potential for center of gravity offset? Yeah. Yeah, and then he got into some way deep in the weed stuff. Uh, yeah, well, I'll just leave that alone. Um, yeah, yeah, if you, if you don't let the tooling move the material when you're forming the bullet uh if you if you let the material form itself i guess is a way to say that if you don't have tooling support the material when you move it um you can run into issues where the material forms itself and it doesn't necessarily form itself as consistently as it would with tooling or if you have tooling wear or if you have incorrectly made tooling the wrong size stuff like Uh, that so the tooling probably has more to do with it than the process as long as the process was designed with the right tooling design for the most part now with like bonded bullets um you're melting the lead and then when it cools back down it kind of flows and forms uh forms the the top surface how it's how it's going to and it kind of does that on its own Mm -hmm. um and that's caused some issues for us um and just in terms of being consistent yeah and that you say us as a bullet manufacturing industry right. bonded bullets yeah. where you're doing that is they're a little they're, more they're harder. harder to make yeah yeah consistently accurate um cup and core where you just swedge them together is, is a lot easier to get the performance out of it okay uh and then he, he had that question about interstitial like heating the he's talking about energy and heating the copper and lead up and then getting interstitial like atoms. atomic movement and interlacing of the atoms that's um that's not what's going to cause a CG offset. That that scale is so small, it's yeah, okay. not measurable. Yeah. If awesome. that was your only source of CG offset, you're doing it right. You're doing yeah. it right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So the last question for the uh, dispersion episode comes from Terry Raymond. And he says, uh, thanks for all the great info. So the longer the barrel, the more moving. So is that saying that a shorter barrel moves less and is then more accurate? So are shorter barrels more accurate because they are moving less is what he's asking. Yeah. If uh, if everything else is exactly the same. <laughs> I was, <yeah. laughs> was going to say, if barrel length was the sole source of dispersion, yes, uh, but it's not. Yeah. So, okay. no, um, that's not, that's, there's so many other things going on, even just barrel to barrel. I mean, sure. It, it, no, you're, um, you know, no shot across the bow, but... Uh, there's there's way more stuff going on there. You you probably just concentrated on one little aspect there, which is fine. You know. Yeah. There's um, a lot of information. But that's that's certainly not it. What we were talking about with barrel length was the fact that as you cut the barrel back, uh, your muzzle blast uh, signature gets much larger, and so the exposure of the bullet to that, you have a higher a higher chance of getting higher levels of dispersion with a shorter barrel because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as all the other aspects of it that are unique to the barrel. Uh, no, no, you can't okay. really make that statement. Yeah, that's and we've done a lot of testing where we grab multiple barrels of the same contour and we just even change twist rate. So one will be a one and seven, one and seven and a half, one and eight, one and eight and a half, and shoot bullets that are happily stable at one and eight and a half all the way across, same load, same everything, and there's more, just whatever it is about each barrel. You know, from barrel to barrel, there's more change in dispersion from whatever factors that are there that we're not seeing or measuring or don't know how to measure yet um, than simple factors like, oh, yeah, the twist rate made a huge difference here. It's You, you can have a seven twist that shoots better than the eight and a half or vice versa. And it's there's there's so many knobs to turn mm-hmm. on that equation that, yeah, it's just saying that shorter barrels are more accurate. That's not an accurate That's statement. like a theory-based yeah one aspect of many okay well and, and anecdotally you know you look at f class and bench rest those guys are shooting 26 28 30 inch barrels on yeah. a lot of their stuff so and those guys are you know sh- shooting yeah. some of the smallest groups at long range you know ever so, recorded well, yeah. so we, we both had 36 inch 300 PRCs, and they didn't shoot any worse or any better than my 30 inch or 24 inch 300 PRCs either so right on yeah. excellent we, so moving into episode 54. Now, this is where we had special guest Jeff Seward on our podcast. And, man, the stuff that that guy forgot about ballistics is, you know, would fill up many books. Mm-hmm. Uh, of And I can, you know, what he's forgot is more than a lot of most people would know. So first comment on that podcast comes from Alan Faulkner. He says, this is a formal request for a gain twist episode. Now, that one comment on YouTube 
where Alan just asked for a Gain Twist episode, had three comments on there. 14 people liked it. So people are interested on Gain Twist. So again, not a question, but people want to know. Yeah. Yeah. We've right. discussed we could, that with We could do Jeff. an episode. It'd probably be a good one to do with Jeff because the, the area that Gain Twist has been heavily used is in that large cow world that, that Jeff lived for a long time in. Um, so artillery pieces, mm-hmm. stuff like that is what I'm saying. Uh, we've messed with Gain Twist a little bit. Um, what we've seen is that, uh, there again, there's there's other things going on. So, you know, going from a standard twist to a gain twist doesn't alienate all the other problems that you have to deal with. It's not the one, you know, the one button fix, yep. right? The, the take this pill and lose this weight. It's not that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's some interesting things going on with gain twist that, that you know, maybe we, we cover in that episode. Yeah. It'll change this, your yeah. pressure and velocity a little bit. Uh, changes the the wear state on the projectile for sure. You know, you're changing how fast you're spinning it up. You're probably changing the some of the dynamics that the barrel is experiencing. You know, yeah. would be reasonable, uh, reasonable. But yeah, maybe a whole episode on that when we get Jeff back on. Very cool. When hunting the wild, challenges abound. Leave nothing to chance. 7mm PRC from Hornady. All right, so moving on to uh, Derek Featherstone. He said, again, what a wonderful podcast. Answers so many questions, but at the same time, generates so many more, as it always does. He asks, with your experience in test reloading, you folks know so much about powders. Can you make a podcast about powder dynamics? Uh, Again, that is a question, but also more of a comment. Uh, People want to know more about propellant. Yeah, I'm sure we could. I'm sure we could do something there. Um, we're fortunate enough to work uh, hand in hand with with many propellant manufacturers and and get to see behind the scenes a little bit. Um, sure. So I have to be careful not to, you know, say anything that that would compromise them. Wouldn't want that at all. But there's yeah. definitely a lack of um, information or understanding out there about powders and kind of how they work and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and it's like that episode we did on internal ballistics. There's such a small keyhole to look through because the people that know all the knowledge you know, work in an area that is exposed to it, but there's really no outside use for that information. So it doesn't come around very often. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we've got a litany of questions and comments uh, from Ron Loney. Uh, Ron, uh, we're going to, we abbreviated a lot of this stuff, but uh, he asks, I have some powder questions. And the first one was, doesn't increased surface area by the shape of the powder increase the consistency and completeness of the combustion so it does the surface area uh by the shape of the powder does that increase the consistency of the combustion no i think that probably has more to do with the chemistry of it yeah there's so many different things going on there with propellant like you know we need to probably just do an episode on it to talk about those Mm -hmm. kind of foundational makeups of it to to better answer that question but the short answer is no um, yeah. Right. Th- there's other ways to control that. Yeah. Increase surface area. And then yeah. there's, there's yeah, the, what you're really looking for is maintaining a consistent surface area as the as the powder burns away. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that gets pretty deep pretty yeah. quick. So his follow up to that was, aren't ball powders, spherical powders, because they have less surface area, not as reliable in providing high velocities because of their incomplete combustion? Actually, the opposite. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the one of the ways that ball powders work in a way that traditional extruded powders don't is their chemistry, the chemical makeup yeah. of them, the energy content, and the and the burn rate modifiers um, that they have. So, no, I mean, it, <laughs> it's the exact opposite. You want to juice the speeds up, and you yeah. put in some ball powder. That's right. Yep. And of that of more certain to, types. Yeah, that is more know, to do not with the chemistry equal. than the shape. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then his last question that we're going to pull up out of here, he asks uh, regarding uh, bullet accuracy is the accuracy of lead core bullets versus monolithic bullets. Um, yeah, basically the difference between the two and does the changing of the shape of the bullet and the way it expands, uh, and obturate, does that affect its accuracy? Depends on the barrel. Mostly. Um, we saw some issues with like CX and GMX early on where if there's inconsistent bore diameter down the length of the barrel, um, a lead core bullet will, still have enough pressure behind it to obturate, but the solid copper bullets are stronger 
mm -hmm. and take more pressure to obturate to fill the bore. So as they pop over those loose spots, they, they, they don't, don't fill the bore. and you have the chance for inboard tilt. Yeah, in mm -hmm. tilt okay. or gas escaping around the side of it or a bunch of other stuff like that. So, yeah, by and large, the lead core bullets are just more forgiving is, I think, a easy yeah, way to Yeah, more forgiving to that. a variable variable bore diameter yeah and it, a lot of it comes back to the quality of the barrel yeah unless that mm -hmm. bore opening is at the muzzle and then it all bets are off yeah yeah yep. okay well that wraps up the number 54 with jeff seawert now we're moving on to one of our most popular episodes your groups are too small um this was the follow-up on episode 52 um man we 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 ruffled some feathers with that particular podcast, specifically with the bench rest and F class crowd, um, but with, with everybody that has shot uh, and and shot for accuracy and for precision and reloaded for accuracy and precision. That one really got some some wheels turning in people's heads in a mm -hmm. good way, and and some people took it the wrong way, and um, some people think yeah, I won't get into that. But regardless. Um, <laughs> It was it was a good podcast because we we waited to put out that information until we had huge data sets. Yeah, I mean, like quite literally several barrels worth, barrel life worth of data sets to to throw at this. Uh, and we came out in what I thought was a very neutral position. Like here's what we've tested. We haven't tested at all. But we have tested this, and we know what we've seen from this testing, and we didn't want to rub people's noses in it. Uh, but we also don't want to be apologetic about it right. uh, because it's scientifically valid data that yeah. was obtained, not from random number generation. Yeah. But sorry, from, this is what happened. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is great because it spurred a bunch of interaction, and, and it got people thinking. And to go back to, you know, us three have very similar childhoods in that we're running around shooting stuff, having a good time and, and, and thinking, okay, why does that bullet not go to the same place every time? Or why, why do I have to hold up this high at this range, but it doesn't work the same at that range or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it just gets the, the wheels turning to, to question things. And, and that's great stuff all the way around. So first question we pulled out from that comes to us from fingers fast. And, uh, in regard to the groups being too small, he says, please do an episode on cleaning and when it actually impacts accuracy. That would be awesome. Just as many divergent opinions and myths on cleaning, i.e., I clean every 10 rounds, every 100 rounds, every 1,000 rounds. There's a lot of information out there. It's uh, hard data on large sample sizes would be really interesting. And I agree. I think a lot of that being cartridge dependent would make that a tough one. What do you guys think? Yeah, same thing we said earlier. I can specifically right off right off the top of my head think of a 6.5 PRC that was dramatically like 175 foot per second faster and horrible accuracy over the course of 150 rounds, 125 rounds, I think is where we called it. Mm -hmm. And then that six arc that we shot. <laughs> 2,000 rounds, brand new to 2,000 rounds and really saw no difference. So yeah. it's just totally powder cartridge pressure dependent. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think, you know, in regard to cleaning, I'll just throw out my two cents for what I do. Uh, and it's not super duper scientific at all, really. But for a lot of what I shoot, 6 Arc, 6.5 Creedmoor, they're not super maintenance intensive regardless. And I usually shoot 20 right off the bat on a brand new barrel maybe a couple five-shot groups, a few five-shot groups, whatever it is, get 20 rounds on it, give it a cleaning, and then I'll shoot it to 100, give it a cleaning, do some load development, and I'll typically practice with it, however many rounds that is. I'll shoot a match, and then I'll clean it after after a match. So it might have two to three, 350 rounds on there, maybe 400 rounds on a, on a six arc or something, mm -hmm. and I'll clean at that point. On my hunting rifles, my 7 PRC, my 6.5 PRC, I'm in my opinion, I'm cleaning for a different reason. I'm not, I'm, I'm cleaning more as a maintenance thing. Uh, I know I'm never going to hunt on a clean barrel and I know I'm not going to shoot a bunch of rounds on it. So I typically clean every 60 rounds, 75 rounds, mm -hmm. maybe even every 50 rounds. And again, I'm not scrubbing it to bare steel. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot the 50 rounds. Let's say I'm going to throw in some wipeout. I'm going to let it sit for a night, patch the wipeout out in the morning shoot five shots as a fowler, and then I'm good to go for another 40 rounds or whatever it is. I'm not scrubbing it to beer steel. I'm just trying to keep it very consistent. Mm -hmm. um, now, on the maintenance-intensive cartridges, like six Creedmoor, um, 
6.5 PRC, any of those hot rods, 6 and 6.5s, uh, I do clean a lot more often just mm-hmm. because I've seen the pressure barrels. I've seen the, you know, the, the uh, bore scope stuff. Like, and you can ruin a PRC barrel in 150 rounds. You can ruin it if you're, if you're getting wild. And so I, I do clean those significantly yeah. more often. I think that's I'll typical, kick that over to you guys yeah, now. Yeah, typical of most magnums. Um, yep. And then I guess that I think I've pretty much said I've, it's, a, it's about the same thing that you do for my match rifles. Um, I will say if there's something that you know you're not going to shoot for months at a time, just clean it. Clean it. Maybe even run an oil patch because I know we use Let it sit around. 416 stainless, you know, but that uh, that's, that not, mean every that's not an absolute stainless yeah. always in every situation. And the powder fouling sometimes leaves stuff in there that attracts moisture. And uh, it's not unheard of for a stainless barrel to, to yeah. still rust if you let it sit, especially if you're near the ocean or very humid climate or whatever. So Good yeah. point. Um, maybe to answer his question a little bit about, you know, I clean every 10 or 100 or 1,000 or, or what, what are those methodologies and why. Um, you look at the bench trust world and a lot of those guys will clean – in between strings you yeah know? i mean and that makes sense you know if you if you listen to that dispersion podcast and we talk about how you know a little piece of raised metal in the barrel grabs a piece of copper and that gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and that's you know affecting each bullet that passes a little bit differently well in those worlds where you're attempting to control everything as consistently as possible sure it makes sense to do that sure um i mean if it has a good result right mm-hmm. uh so you, you may be doing nothing positive by cleaning, but you're not hurting it, you know, which you might be hurting it if you let it keep getting dirtier. Who knows? Yeah. And if you're um, not using a bore guide and good cleaning practices. <laughs> right. Um, but my question would be, what what is the baseline that's told you that you need to clean? And have you cleaned well enough? Instead of just arbitrarily cleaning at different metrics, which is good for like a... Uh, preventative maintenance standpoint mm-hmm. absolutely and like you said certain cartridges require it you know you can't get away with laying down and just ripping rounds through one but you can another um but i can't i guess back to that reference ammo thing i talked about before it, it's very helpful to you if you have some sort of tool that you can use to determine when it's like necessary to clean or it's trending that direction yep. you know people say well i only clean when my group sizes open up well that goes back to that whole sample size podcast we talked about you know if the sample size basis of your of your rifle is five shot groups and you haven't done very many of them then and you you happen to shoot another one and it's uh, you know 50 percent larger and you say oh it's because my barrel is dirty well that's yeah it's not really solid uh data there so maybe have some reference ammo and know what it shoots for a group and know what it shoots for velocity and use that as a tool to assess oh yeah i i can only get away with this many rounds before this happens velocity mm-hmm. picks up this much my dispersion increases whatever it is but um we fight cleaning a lot here uh, from from customers that have problems. I mean, uh, cleaning a barrel, I think, is done um, ineffectively more often than it's not. Yeah, so, or it's not done at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or it's like, hey, I pulled uh, this little you know, sock on a rope through it or, yeah. or whatever it may be. Um, it's not effectively removing the deposits of copper and carbon that are in the barrel. And that's what's actually going to affect the performance. Mm-hmm. Um, so we see that a lot. We also hear people say, oh, you don't have to clean it. You know, the, the more you shoot it, the better it shoots. Okay, maybe up to a point. But yeah. I think it's better to have a preventative maintenance plan to keep yourself from having a catastrophic issue than it is to just ignore it. Nothing in life, you can't drive your vehicle until the engine blows up and then go, oh, yeah, I guess it's time for an oil change. Yeah. Now. You know, or I mean, brakes is probably a better analogy. Yeah, exactly. Man. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the vehicle has brakes, and I'm just going to run them until the car doesn't stop. Yeah, so clean your barrel, do it right, do it effectively, and try to do it in an educated way where you're measuring meaningful change. Yeah. That would be what I would recommend. Yep, 100%. Awesome. All right, moving on to Tony Brush. Tony writes in, he says, I really enjoyed this podcast. Well, appreciate it, guys. Uh, That one's, you know, uh, uh, comments are like that, that start off that way great because you know we don't have to do these we want to do these and it's great to hear to hear that people are liking them Mm -hmm. he goes on to say really got me thinking about how many decisions we make in life are based on a small sample size i do have a question i've heard in this podcast as well as a previous one that you just pick a powder and a velocity that you like and you go with it my question is what is your criteria for not picking somewhere close to a max charge i know traditional thinking means you need to work up to make sure that uh, pressures remain safe in an individual rifle. But other than pressure signs for hunting or long-range precision, when would lower velocity be a preferred choice? 
unless you're needing subsonic or your expected target range and impact velocity do not correlate to optimal bullet performance. So to highlight those questions, uh, what is our criteria for not picking somewhere too close to a max charge? And uh, what was the other question in there? When is yeah. lower velocity Yeah, when preferred? is a lower velocity preferred? Yeah. So, yeah, kick that one over to you guys. Uh, uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, you should never, just like, you know, the old saying goes, you should never pick, some ma pick a max charge because you don't know the conditions of your barrel, the conditions of that powder, lot to lot, yeah, uh, or, or that bullet, and all those th three things in combination, Throat what pressure geometry. it's going to generate. Yeah. yeah, all those variables. So the reason you never start at a max or near max charge is because if you start low, Hopefully, as you work your way up, you catch those problems before they come become catastrophic. You mm -hmm. know, we don't want anybody to get hurt. So, so don't start at max. That's that's not a good idea. Agreed. Um, so that would answer that one, in my opinion. Um, and as far as yeah, like uh, I guess I, w my basis on on saying I start a grain or two under max, uh, just to feel out of if, if a bullet and a powder combination are going to work. Uh, I think is the reference to this question. Uh, that was in three or four different calibers uh, over, I don't know, 3,500 or 4,000 rounds worth of testing with 15, 16 different types of powder. Um, but at best, as you increased powder charge and velocity, the dispersion stayed the same. And, and that's that, at best that's they at, stayed the same. That's at best. Um, and that was a rarity. Um, typically what I saw was some level of, of dispersion increase with an increase in propellant charge. So I say, uh, yeah, back off and you've got a good, uh, you've got a better chance of getting good dispersion. better dispersion. Um, and if you run hip probability, it takes really, really, really massive changes in velocity to outweigh dispersion not very big changes in dispersion mm. okay so usually the dispersion gain is worth the loss velocity from a hit probability standpoint that's awesome so when would a lower velocity be preferred when is when dispersion yeah. is the name of the game yeah and so in in that respect if it's like if it has a terminal performance aspect to whatever you're using this for so for match shooting you you're basically for match shooting the the, the thing that gets weighed out is wind performance and then and slowing it down will increase your like the same muzzle velocity spread over at a lower velocity will have a larger elevation spread mm -hmm. at long range um and and the same thing more wind you know and so what you're looking for is the difference in the velocity a plus dispersion a uh and what does that manifest itself out to downrange versus velocity b dispersion b what does that manifest itself out to downrange uh, and then kind of finding a happy spot now um and then and then if you have a terminal aspect to that then you have a minimum muzzle velocity that you have to have to make the bullet work to make the bullet work at a certain distance and mm -hmm. so you d you pick the, the target the distance the bullet okay i need this much muzzle velocity at a bare minimum and and you're kind of stuck there. I mean, on the on the that's on the floor. Now you might not need the floor to start off with, but uh, and and like I said, some of those trends of dispersion increase with powder increase, that's some of those are really shallow. So yeah. sometimes, yeah, maybe you start here, and then you after you've decided, oh yeah, that's a viable powder bullet combination for this barrel, then you can play around with seeing how close to the top I can go yeah. safely. And if you can get 100 foot per second out of it or 50 or whatever, and you're still getting acceptable dispersion, then great. Rocket, yeah. 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 Then awesome. It's, yeah. And that, one more note, that velocity is tied to a whole bunch of other things that you experience too. Recoil. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> it's tied to the time of flight to the target. Yeah. Powder so, consumption you know, in today's you, market. And powder <laughs> consumption, yeah. If you want to see your own bullet impact, if that's important to you in making a correction or whatever it may be, then slowing it down a little bit is going to give you more time to manage the recoil and watch what yeah. happens. And that's becoming more and more prevalent and popular and understood in the last couple of years than it was. Man, when, we, when I started shooting precision rifle stuff with you in 2013 mm -hmm. that wasn't even a consideration we were shooting 308s back then but then you know it was the 6.5 race and then the six millimeter race and then now uh just this last year and a half or so i've personally switched over to a 
six arc from a six Creedmoor, mm-hmm. and slowing that bullet down has made a world of difference. It's incredible yeah. mm-hmm. in seeing trace, seeing impact, making a correction. It's like you were, you know, just learning how to drive a race car, and it felt like you're on a spaceship. And then once you get real comfortable and you slow down, then it's like everything's happening in slow motion. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I remember the days of how can I make this six millimeter bullet go thirty one fifty to thirty one seventy five. Yeah, and just and under the stayed, speed limit. Yeah, yeah, just just in the rules, you know. Um, Those days are gone. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's so much uh, more pleasant and controllable. Yep. Another one, um, just real quick, would be, you know, the the undefined term of barrel life. Uh, yeah. If you run a more moderate velocity, generally what's going to come with that is a more moderate pressure, and we have seen where if you're not exposing a barrel to you know sixty to sixty five thousand pounds of pressure every shot, maybe you're exposing it to you know. 52 to 57 yeah uh that barrel will last longer it will perform more consistently over more rounds which is always Um, great yeah especially barrels aren't cheap so don't be afraid to slow things down a little bit don't slow them down too much because you can get to an unsafe level if you 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 know try to start going below the minimums those those minimums are listed for a reason just like the maxes yeah always reference a good trustworthy handbook of cartridge reloading by hornady or any other (laughs) pressure tested data yep all right moving on to brent brent says so now that you are rewriting the book on all of our load development processes i'd like to see a follow-up test where you use conventional load development methods like the ocw test and the velocity test with three to five shot groups to identify a node and a non-node then load up enough cases of both to be statistically sound and then go shoot those two groups My hypothesis is that if the load development doesn't matter, because it is the same group size that matters, then the statistical groups should shoot about the same distribution. However, if the standard load development methods do have merit, then the group from the node would theoretically be smaller than the group from the non-node. I look forward to your findings. Yeah, that's how I started all this. Yeah, that was yeah. the basis of it. Yeah, so, he act, we, so Brent... We, we, we just repeated an OCW test um, and ladder tests and satellite tests ad nauseum and then Seeking compiled depth. yeah and compiled all of that data into a composite group and then said, wow, this, 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 when you get all those composite groups together are not that different from each other. And then each line, <laughs> each line, because I think I did seven five-shot groups you know, mm-hmm. and so each set of five shot groups would say, okay, that one's good. Now that one's good. Now that one's good. And I was like, they're not the same, you know, the couple of them, maybe two out of the seven or three out of the seven would be, but that was four of them weren't, you know? Yeah. So then when you look at combine all the groups together, then it's like, oh yeah, actually there's just a steady trend of how that performance sways. As With it, the powder charging. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we used to do all those. We used to yeah. do optimal charge. You know, we did all yeah. the load methodologies that are out there. And, and we just got to the point where one of us, I guess, kind of woke up and was like, hey, is this really doing anything? <laughs> everybody's said, using a different color out. marker. But when we get to the end, everybody's marker is the same color. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, okay. Right. So, so great question. But that, I mean, summarizes why we did what we did. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, I want to say, too, uh, Jeff Seward's website has a... Kind oh, of yeah. a page dedicated to that, the tyranny of statistics. And yeah. com. Yeah. Check that out. Jump on his website. Um, and he's got a, a whole document on there. Uh, yeah, he did like a, what I remember offhand is he did a 100-shot Satterley repeat test. Mm. Uh, and it's just a giant block of the extreme spread of the velocities. And the, each test does its own thing. It's a so line it of 100 different nodes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Weird. <laughs> okay, yeah. So you started off with, yeah, several different colors, and then by the end, everything yeah. was the same color. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Moving on to Dwet Bava. Question. How do you find the charge to start with between max and minimum? I use quick load and GRT to calculate a node on the rifle and do load development with that. Is a barrel's node important then? Thanks for an awesome podcast. So, guys, how do you find your starting charge between min and max? Do you use quick load or GRT, uh, and are you concerned with a node? Yeah, the book. There's a book uh, right there. Generally, the have a velocity I want to target. Kind of want to be in this range, and I generally pick a charge weight that's you know towards the lower end of that velocity range, especially if it's near a, you know, if the velocity I want is near max. Then I'm going to back it down a little bit from there and see how how good is my gun adding up to what was recorded in the book, mm-hmm. and then I work my way from there. Yeah, okay. so we, I cross reference a few of those. So ours and Hodgson's got the yeah. reloading data center. Yep. And so we really don't use quick load or GRT, and 
we're not concerned with nodes in the slightest. Yeah, and in the you know, like if you're doing a wildcat or something like that where you don't have load data, maybe um, quick load would be a, yeah, yeah applicable it might, then. Might be worth looking into, but use it conservatively too, because I've seen some of those tools give erroneous information. Yeah, well, and as good as those tools are, like with anything, there's always limitations, and there's different variances in yeah. internal case volume. Yeah. And not, different not the def not the fault of the tool, yeah. just. G different, garbage in, garbage yeah, out. And different throat geometry. I've right. seen that doing pressure and velocity testing. Different throat geometry will make a world of difference yeah. in your pressure or, and velocity. Or bullet construction. Yeah. 165 grain, 30 cal, whether it's yep. a CX or a lead core bolt, that's a, that yeah. makes a difference. So, yeah, I will I will third that, not second that. I will be the third person to say, I look at the manual. I already have a target velocity. I typically already know what I'm picking for powder because for me it's real simple. If I'm going for accuracy, I pick my bullet, like Jaden always says, I pick my bullet based on what the job is, and I identify the velocity that I want, and then I identify a single-based extruded powder that will do that job. Or re Alliant Reloader 16 or 26, if that's applicable for the burn speeds I'm looking for. Those two double-based extruded powders, but they're just fantastic. And we know those extruded propellants typically produce really good dispersion. Yeah. Yep. So uh, it's that easy. Moving on to a question from Mr. Sarah. He says, amazing podcast. Information based on significant data is what I've been looking for. Without me knowing it, I have always felt that most data is too random and therefore inconclusive. Could you assign a number for the steps in your reloading based on importance? For example, if powder and bullets are number one and reducing powder charge is number two, how significant is selection of the resizing die? If at all, full length versus neck sizing. Does it matter? How much does concentricity matter, if at all? Uh, good question. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I think they all matter. Uh, you know, everything everything matters and is a contributing factor to some extent. The real question is, is do they matter enough that you can alter them and it have an effect on a positive or negative effect on your result? Sure. Um, I think in the case of you know, what's our priority? Uh, I think we talked about that, that it was, you know, pick the pick the bullet that's going to do the job the best and then pick the, the best powder or a couple best powders and go. So that would be those priorities. Yep, but, number one and two, like you said. But the how significant is the selection of sizing dies, you know, the sizing method, full length versus neck? Does it matter? How much does concentricity matter? Yes, they all matter to an extent. The question is, is it enough to alter your groups in a positive or negative way? The only way to answer that is for you to test that to because test your it, rifle yeah. is unique, that die is unique, that brass is unique. Mm -hmm. There's trends there that can be applied, but there's, there's not no, a general there's no blanket universal rule. Answer. Yep. I would say for me personally, not the not the sciencey, statistically valid kind of stuff. Yep, he nailed it with bullet and powder, number one. I'm using full length resizing dies. I bump the shoulder. I like to use a mandrel because it gives me a warm and fuzzy that the final sizing of the neck was done from the inside, not the outside. Um, so I don't use bushing dies uh, for that reason. And concentricity, I will check concentricity a couple times. And if it's less than five thou, I'm moving on with my life. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically where I'm at. But again, that's just completely anecdotal. Miles, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I don't know. Different brands of dyes are interesting. I think that's a subjective thing. People like people like what they like. I sure. mean, they're they're definitely different, and there's different ways to use the different manufacturers and different types of dyes. Um, use what you like. Uh, as far as neck sizing, I haven't done that since like 2003. Yeah, I neck sized for my through eight Winchester back in the day. Uh, outside neck turned the brass that I had like. Yeah, it was the reliability yeah. standpoint of bumping the shoulder back a couple thou, one or two thou, uh, and knowing that the round is going to chamber without beating the bolt closed mm -hmm. outweighs any theoretical accuracy benefit that yep. may or may not exist uh, neck sizing. And you tested that, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't you neck size a whole bunch of brass and then full length No, I neck it? turned a whole bunch. Oh, that was neck turned. Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, neck turned, and then I honed the necks and graphited bullets. Uh, yeah, you went deep in the weeds on that. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> one and two, and lion share, three through whatever, very minuscule in our Seating depth, yeah. brass prep, sorting brass by internal volume, maybe. Yeah. I don't if you want to get real deep in the weeds, but you're yeah. getting pretty. Just make sure whatever you're doing is statistically valid or repeatable. 
Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do, like, if your discipline necessitates the smaller sample sizes, make it repeatable. Make it do it a whole bunch of times so that it's stable in its behavior. Then you can trust it. Yeah. But if you do something once or twice, I mean, you don't know really what it what it's doing. Right on. Let's get loaded. There's no better time to stock your reloading batch. Choose from the most durable, precise, and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded. Visit Hornady.com for further details. All right, moving on to a question from Eric Clem. He writes, uh, really excellent follow-up. I'm still unclear as to whether a slight change in charge weight, for example, 0.3 grains, will have an effect on my point of impact. I guess my question is whether in your research and testing have you found there is such a thing as a pressure tolerant load more so than other charge weights all else being equal. So does powder extreme spread really matter in the world of dispersion? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. This is going to be the, it depends. He's he's asking a slight change for a maybe about three tenths of a grain and that there's there's a lot of knobs to turn there it, it could in some situations it could not in others yeah and in your experience doing hand trickled versus thrown from a powder measure did you document any change with the different because you're i mean hand thrown yeah. powder measure we're talking two to four maybe half a grain uh, of variance. yeah you can see like 4350 you can see seven or eight tenths of it's usually of plus or minus a half percent Okay, so yeah. if you're plus or minus a half a percent and then you hand trickle, what did you see from a dispersion standpoint? Difference? Dispersion is better when you weigh to the, as tight as you can weigh. Yeah. Uh, to like the way you got the two hundredth scales, is that what yeah. the, the mm-hmm. auto trickler scale? Oh, the um, FX 120i. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you take the time and weigh that out, it did trend to group m- marginally, and I mean very marginally better. Um, like you, probably single digit percentile better. Yeah, like two, three percent better. Not fifty percent better. Yeah, no. like like oh wow, those are those all were a little bit better. Yeah, like but on a thirty shot sample, it's, you're talking measuring from uh, a, a true half minute thirty shot group, say one inch at two hundred yards, to now it was eight or nine tenths. Maybe that much. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. So it was pretty wow, and that's with. Yeah, half a grain. That's going from basically plus or minus a tenth and a half to plus or minus two hundredths of a grain. Wow. Um, and and then as far as velocity spreads go, g- generally you got like a three tenths window that you will need a lot of rounds, hundreds of rounds to see the difference in long term mm. ES and SD. So on the small side of things, 0.3 grain total variation or less, it's that's probably within the noise. That's probably not making a big For impact. For the bulk of everybody, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, the <laughs> the question is, uh, is the improvements that you can get worth the time it takes you to get them? And the answer to that is different. For the For short everybody. range bench rest guy, the answer is yes, yeah. because he's trying to make everything as perfect as possible. For the sh- for the field shooter, a lot of them, yes, the, it is worth the time. Some of them, no. Yeah. You know, it, <laughs> they, it's, it's it's up for debate, and a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, is personal and, preference. And I would I would say too, probably like boat tail and crown geometry or maybe just bullets and barrels interaction, I think you could probably have some that are more susceptible to it mm. and some that okay. are less. So. Yeah. I well, would expect to see it on larger charge weight variations. I would be I would be very surprised to see a large statistical difference on a say forty ish grain cartridge that varies by point three tenths of a grain on charge weight. It's, it's probably there, but yeah, it's probably pretty small also. Right on. Yeah, and, and anytime I read a question like this or I hear somebody ask a question like this, my mind really goes to... Uh, what car is the best? Well, no, I was <laughs> going to say uh, a precision rifle competitor, uh, Justin Watts from Oklahoma. I mean, that man, at least two years ago, uh, when I learned about this, straight winning national level PRS matches shooting factory Hornady 6 Creed more 108 ELD match ammo. Mm-hmm. Factory ammo. And we hold our ammo as tight as we can possibly get it, but when you're taking extruded propellant through our powder measure systems, it's, it's not to the kernel. It's you're not, getting uh, yeah. variation. It's, it's right. volumetric. Yeah, and he's winning matches doing that. And so um, I, I think of that when I hear this, that the nut behind the bolt is, you know, oftentimes more, you know, 
more indicative of how you're going to perform than three tenths of a powder. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, moving on to a question from Woodstock Rifles. Woodstock Rifles says, more great information on sample size for a given load to see if it is legit. I would like to see an hour and a half podcast on your traditional hunting bullets, the ones that are not in Ford off. The interlock and the SST bullets have worked great for years. How do they actually compare against the ELDX at traditional hunting ranges, say 25 to 350 yards, coyotes, pigs, and deer? Some gel tests at 2,400 to 2,700 muzzle velocity would be nice to see at 200 yards. What the hunting bullets actually do at range in gel, not 100-yard high velocity. I have never had a rifle that shoots a max load in your hunting loading manual. Excuse me, I've never had a rifle that shoots a max load well in your hand loading manual. Uh, year round. Yeah. I have always had my best groups in my rifles, just a couple grains past half to three quarters the way up the ladder from minimum to maximum. Hopefully I said that right. Well, hopefully I said that right. <laughs> uh, basically what he's saying is he's gotten his best accuracy, most consistent accuracy, regardless of environment when he's at a modest charge weight, somewhere mm -hmm. between half and three quarters. And that's, that reminds me of something surprise. that the other guy that was asking why you would choose a lesser charge weight. That's another reason. Oh, um, environmental. It, they're, they're reliable. Like yeah. whether it's 20 degrees out or 120 degrees out, I'm not going to pop primers and lock my gun up and break my firing pin or do yep. anything yeah. goofy. So Jaden, the ELDX compared to traditional bullets like the interlock and SST. And I kick that question over to you first, not because uh, I don't think Miles has a good opinion on it. Uh, obviously, he's a good bullet engineer. But you were there for the Legacy products, mm -hmm. and then you were there for the ELDX bullet, the entire development. Yep. So how does it compare to the interlock and the SST at traditional hunting ranges at traditional velocities? Yeah, so... Obviously, the ELDX has a huge advantage aerodynamically. It's a race car for a shape. Uh, the Legacy bullets, I mean, the SSTs are pretty slippery, too. Yeah. Uh, the interlock's a lot less so. You know, that, that bigger me plat, that old lead tip uh, kind of technology from back in the, the 40s and 50s. How do they perform terminally? Um, all very similar at those traditional ranges. Like he notes, you know, 25 yards to 350 yards. They're all pretty similar there. One thing you will notice that's a little bit different is the ELDX flows more than the interlock or the SST. Both the interlock and the SST kind of have a traditional expansion rate and metric where when they open, they kind of rapidly open to full diameter, and that's kind of it for the bullet's movement. From there, the bullet just slows down until it comes to rest in the terminal tissue, where the ELDX at the higher velocity impacts like you have from 25 to 350 yards that bullet is kind of in a state of continual flow because yeah. the nose is so long and right. bearing surface in general is much longer than you find with SST and interlock. You have more length of the bullet that you can work. And so it flows differently. And that creates a little bit of a different wound channel characteristic. Um, all three of those bullets kill stuff deader than a doornail at those yeah. ranges. And I've you know? killed things with all three of those bullets and they work great. Yeah. And I mean, those old, those old spire point, those interlock bullets, those things shoot, man. Oh, I you mean, want to talk about accurate, man. There's some, yeah, like a classic 150 flat base 30 cal. Yeah. I mean, don't don't overlook, you know, the, the shiny, sexy race car shape of these newer bullets. They have their place, most certainly. Um, but those old standbys, I mean, they, they work very, very well. Yeah, right on. And like you said, you know, they all work very, very similar terminally at those mm -hmm. traditional ranges where you're going to get... Yeah, you know, 50 to 60% weight retention at those ranges. No. Um, excellent. Miles, anything to add? No? Excellent. Second deer I ever killed was an M1 Grand with a 150 Ew. interlock. Beautiful. Nice. Uh, moving on to Desert Coyotes. He says, with stringing, would that also to apply to gas guns as the piston would impart some vertical forces while firing? So he's talking about vertical stringing on target. Uh, would that be influenced by a gas piston? Sure. Maybe, yeah. I know yeah. for sure, in my experience, gas guns, AR-15s, are much more responsive to point of impact shift when you strap a suppressor onto the muzzle mm -hmm. or when you mess with gas settings um, as far as vertical point of impact. Yeah, that's that whole thing I brought up, I think, in the dispersion podcast about that study the government did with the machine gun. Yep. And they found out, you know, robbing the gas off one side of the barrel created an imbalance. Literally bent the barrel. bending the barrel that's uh, under fire. So go, go check that out. But yeah, absolutely, that could happen. Okay, so moving on to a question from Joel DeBose. 
Joel says, the only question that I have is barrel nodes. Powder charge matters so much is possibly because of that node. If shooting in an anti-node where the barrel is moving at the bullet exit, that changes the equal shots in the node when the muzzle isn't moving as the bullet exits. Next question, especially when shooting various distances, would be combustion process being stable to produce best or close to best extreme spread as well as standard deviations? Uh, not sure I understand that question. You guys, what do you got here? Well, the barrel node concept, I, I have some issue with in that it's a, another one that's not real well defined. It's kind of understood on a level in the community, but I mean, is is the definition of of, of a node a, a point of consistency? You know, is it is it just chaotic results to the left of the node and chaotic results to the right of the node, and you happen to find this one little sliver of real estate where everything's good and great? Mm -hmm. um, the issue that I have with that concept is is generally stuff doesn't work that way there's a there's a trend on either side of it that gets it there you know it's not just complete chaotic noise and then just a little sliver of stability and then chaotic noise again um, and we honestly haven't seen the node by that's identified by the traditional methods in any of the testing we did that was the point of those podcasts yeah. is that you know optimal charge weight tries to find a node right via charge weight movements the the seating ladder depth. test tries yeah. to do it. seating depth tries to do it there's all these different methods and and this node is like this mystical word um, that that nobody can show me how it works. Like give, give me give me the the trace back through these variables to the source that shows me that that is what impacted the net result. And there's none of that. Yeah. Um, so the the word node. I mean, I understand the concept of it, but I think it's it's thrown about the community in a way where there's lack of definition. There's lack of statistical validity to the the use of it or not to describe something mm -hmm. and so um, it, it's almost like being in a, a point of no man's land a little bit i mean there may yeah there's probably nodes but i don't think there you know there may be areas of performance this end of the spectrum might be better than this end you know we just talked about backing off charge weight well does that mean that that backing off charge weight, there's an area of node less than that than there is above that because when you go above it, your results aren't as good as when you drop the powder charge down. I don't know. To me, node is a very specific point or location. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. That's my rant on the word node. Miles, do you I'll have a rant on now. nodes? Um, I mean, m mostly the same thing he said. I never saw the traditional sign you saw. Yeah, I never saw any of that. And, and you know, like I took it for granted most of my reloading career up to doing this large sample testing. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, it's well, that's how, I, and that's how I did load development. Shoot five, check it, the smallest group, you know, they, oh, they go this way, check it again. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that seems like an area where, you know, it's happy. But just thinking about even when you weigh out to the kernel powder charge and you have extremely consistent muzzle velocity spreads there's still several thousand psi variation shot to shot absolutely uh mm -hmm. yeah you know like we say the average okay the average max allowable average pressure or whatever um sure right? and then you know we're below that when we load factory ammunition but there's still shots yeah that, there's still three four five thousand pounds of yeah. extreme spread on pressure right Pretty easily normal. easily yeah, yeah. um so then if that's your forcing function and then that's that variable and you're looking for this tiny little bit of wavelength down the barrel where things are moving or not moving, how consistent are you really at hitting that? Yeah. And is that realistic or is, yeah. I, mean, I, and I don't know. I don't, I, I don't have, I'm not a, yeah. and you know, so inconclusive subject, on that. Yeah, well, let me add subject one more matter thing. Expert, but it doesn't seem like it. I could go wrong. My rant on nodes just there, uh, is not an all-knowing thing. I'm not sitting here saying, I know that nodes don't exist or any of that. Yeah. Obviously, obviously not. There's plenty of things that I don't know. But what I'm saying is in my experience, I've looked under the hood enough of what's going on and in a large enough, you know, sampling different ways and things that I haven't seen it that it calls into question the concept in my mind. However, if you have a node and it's repeatable, this this set of things is better than these other sets of things every single time great great 
Yeah. Good deal. If we want to call that a node, cool. Yeah, um, you but can call, I think you can the, make up a name. Call it a Shamalama Ding Dong. Whatever. <laughs> I think in the popular yeah. use of the term, though, it's it's lost in that small sample size dogma that we've all been brought up yep. in. Uh, yep. uh, yeah, yeah. And then there, there's even things like material properties and temperature swings and stuff that makes me question it even yeah. more. Like, well, for me, again, as the layman in the room, I don't think anybody would would try to say that like things don't have a frequency, right? Like cantilever beams, anything yeah, that's no, suspended it's, it's out. Yeah, no, it's got it's, a node shape or yeah, a mode shape. And the, well, yeah, what okay. we're saying is... The harmonic frequency and there's yeah, nodes Yeah, those are that. real things yep. that are occurring, but whether or not they have an impact on the dispersion... Whether or not your load development strategy can... Affect that. Manipulate those yeah, meaningfully, manipulate. Mm-hmm. that's where I kind of yeah. get skeptical. Yeah. Okay, all right. And then his, his second question, I'm not exactly sure how to how he's saying this so i'm just going to think what i say what i think he's meaning is does having a better combustion I don't, you know air quote that uh to get low extreme spread and standard deviation does that help you shoot things far away and the obvious yes. answer is yes obviously mm-hmm. velocity uh like for the same reasons you mentioned earlier in the podcast that's going to have how consistent you can have drag and how consistent you can have velocity are going to directly affect the dispersion at long range correct all right, so that was Joel. Now moving on to a question from Jim Shepard. A question for you, Miles. Do you shoot a group of 20 shots at sub-MOA? That seems to be what I gathered from your load choice methodology. Do you put the rifle in a fixture in order to take out the human out of the process? Can you please elaborate on your process? I have enjoyed both of these podcasts and greatly appreciate the data-driven approach. Appreciate that comment, Jim. Miles, do you shoot sub him away for 20 shots and do you do it in or out of the fixture only if i do my part yeah <laughs> uh <laughs> quarter inch him away uh yes uh, i shoot well, so early on i did a, i did a lot of testing um accuracy fixture versus shooter um with several shooters myself included and determined that i add like 0. 0.05 to 0. 0.1 moa to the total dispersion so less of an eighth of a minute roundabout yeah yeah compared to our accuracy fixture. accuracy fixture yep. okay well that's i mean you're not and, just and your run of the mill shooter either though let's be honest yeah and and that's that's those are shots that i feel good about mm-hmm. you know what i mean so yeah it, every so often i will throw some shots where it's like yep no didn't did not like did not like how that happened you know yeah. and and so if if that happens and yeah I, i'll take that into account when i assess what happens downrange um but yeah no i look for for a three quarter minute at 20 shots. Mm-hmm. Like I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I've got some combinations that were under a half minute, barely, you know, in that four five to 0.5 minute uh, stuff. That's, that was more in the testing scenario of things. Um, I think I even cut one of those out where I shot right at a half minute from the shoulder with a 6.5 Creedmoor for 20 shots. And then I went, I was like, oh, well, that's awesome. First time I've ever done that. And I went down and cut the group out of paper. And I have that on my desk. Um, but uh, uh, what were we getting at? Uh, my process, yeah. So I, I shoot, I do all my load development and shooting off of uh, from the shoulder, and with a bipod and a bag in the tunnel, it's pretty rock solid. Yeah, um, it's very rock solid. Yeah, like most of the time, it's not hard to aim consistently. Um, I yeah, I think there's definitely a factor that the shooter plays like proper follow through a lot of those advanced you know marksmanship stuff well they're fundamentals they're really. fundamentals yeah, but, but yeah applying them for 20 shots in yeah, a row is right. an advanced technique uh, yeah so uh, properly applying those fundamentals um matters because yep. and i think the difference between me and the accuracy fixture is variability in recoil path for the rifle if if you're not consistent behind the rifle uh even if everything lines up and looks good, and, and when you break the shot, you apply, or you and, and you see this more and more with lighter weight rifles than you do with heavy rifles. So sure. I got a couple of things going for me. I'm a pretty decent shot. I have a 22 pound six arc that doesn't recoil, and I've got a completely controlled conditions mm. lab, yep, and a bag and a bipod. So well, like, what could go wrong? Right. Yeah. So um, that I hopefully that. Yeah. And then as far as like load development stuff, we've. Yeah, we talked about that. I've I would say a, a quick note times. on doing low development for you uh, on the uh, on the accuracy fixture or from the shoulder. So just as a, a, a clarification on our accuracy fixture, it takes 
inch 230 or inch 250 uncontoured blanks to clamp into that thing. So uh, I don't know what barrels you're shooting, but a lot of us shoot yeah. contoured M- barrels. MTU proof MTU competition or competition or contoured or barrels. Yeah. So we, we aren't clamping those into the vise yeah. anywhere, into the, the accuracy fixture anyway. So there we do, you've done those tests where you take an uncontoured blank and you can put it into a chassis and then flop it back in there. But for our personal stuff, everybody in this room, we're shooting contoured barrels as slight of a contour as they may be we can't actually use the accuracy fixture to do those anyway yep um all right lean back lenny he asks i wish miles would put on a tinfoil hat and use his superior analytical mindset to help hornady figure out how to increase production so i can find 6.5 creedmoor casings to purchase uh Hey, Jamie, you got the tinfoil hat? (laughs) Uh, uh, Definitely don't have a question in there or even uh, a witty comment or anything. I mean, that's a witty comment. I don't have a good one. I'm glad we included that. Preston put this question there together. Uh, Great job with that one. More tinfoil hats, more 6.5 Creedmoor cases. I think we got just what the doctor ordered. I'll do what I can. I'll do what I can. (laughs) Excellent. Uh, And on a serious note, uh, we, I'm not going to address it on this podcast. I don't know if it's the right platform to do so or what, but we have done some things to dramatically increase cartridge case production. So you'll see that uh, coming online here. So uh, moving on to a question from Scott. Uh, Scott Abereg, is there a software that I can use that uses the standard deviation of the mean radius to help me select a load and use it to best predict my future performance. So he's talking about how we analyze dispersion and how we're looking at not just ex- excuse me, extreme spread of the dispersion, but also of the, the mean radius and then the standard deviation of the mean radii. Yeah, so it would be standard deviation of the radius. Yeah. Uh, mean yeah. radius would be a, a statistical metric of the radius. So he, it's already using that because it's, it's already a mean. Yeah, yeah, mean radius. Honestly, I mean... Is there a software out there that can help him, though? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, desktop stuff, I think it's Quick Target's an easy one. Um, on your phone is probably way easier to use. Uh, Ballistic Shooter Buddy. X, Range Buddy. Range Buddy. That's um, what it is. We've mentioned, I think, in, in an earlier episode that we're, like, nearing the final stages of, re- of releasing one for the Ford Off app yep. that we think will be super cool. And uh, we'll incorporate a lot of the stuff we've talked about. Excellent. Okay. So, yeah, check those uh, those apps out. Also, you can, yeah, that's, well. Well, you could make an Excel document yeah. like you did. Okay, yeah. probably not for everybody. Not, yeah. <laughs> not X's fun. X's and Y's. Uh, uh, but you can. Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. And you've got it. Standard <laughs> yep. deviation. Uh-huh. Uh, 58 Harwood. In general, with load development, looking for the highest usable speed, would you start with the fastest burning powder or the slowest? Would that change between a spherical or extruded? So if you're looking for the highest velocity, would you choose the fastest or the slowest burning propellant uh, for a given cartridge and bullet combination? And would that change if you were using spherical or extruded? I don't think that. The question he's asking is not most effectively described by the slider that is burn rate. Mm -hmm. That'd be chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So... Yeah, go ahead with the chemistry thing. Yeah, in general, a slower burning powder is going to produce more velocity for you within a given pressure limit. That's because if the cartridge case will fit it, you can get more of that in there. More of that in there is more energy to propel the bullet down the barrel um, if you have a pressure threshold. You know, because the faster powders are going to get you to that pressure threshold sooner. Really fast ball powder, baby. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, Um, since we live in the real world. Yeah, if, there, if, if pressure is considered, which it always should be, um, the answer technically would be you'd go with a slower powder so you could get more in there if the cartridge case would support that yeah. charge weight. And then it I would, would s- also yeah. There's, go... S- oh, I was going to say, there's some powders, too, that have more energy density. Oh, yeah, for sure. that's where I was going to go with yeah. The, yeah. the spherical stuff. Like, yeah. you go with the typically the slowest burning propellant, and then if you throw in there a double base propellant, which is all spherical powders, all, mm-hmm. you know, a handful of extruded powders, that's your win-win. You get more propellant by volume, and you get nitroglycerin. Yeah. And that jazzes so, up the party. Yeah, just look in a reloading manual and look at, you know, a couple different powders and look at the same amount of charge rate of each of them and see what velocities they produce, and that, that's pretty easy to see. All righty. Precision is the world you live in. Your ammunition is Hornady Match. ELD Match bullets with heat shield tips deliver the highest degree of accuracy and consistency. 
Match Ammunition from Hornady. Moving on to uh, all caps, Craig Smith. Um, Craig, uh, I read through this question. He's calling you out, Jaden. Oh. Jaden. Jaden. I'm here. Jaden. Yep, okay. I'm ready. Ballistic Jesus. I've heard you reference that hand loaders should not load to a velocity higher than what's listed in the SAMI print. Yet, Hornady factory match ammo is higher by 10 feet per second. Mm -hmm. Additionally, I think I heard you mention on a Gunworks YouTube video that you were hand loading 225 ELD matches to 2,900 feet per second from a 26 and a half inch 300 PRC. This is a full 100 feet per second faster than Sammy spec and 90 feet per second faster than the factory match ammo. So were you over pressure? If not, how are you able to safely get so much higher velocity? Thanks for making the technical video. Yes, I use a lot of Hornady bullets for reloading in both pistol and rifle cartridges. So not so much calling you out, just cool. asking for a clarification. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Craig. And obviously a devout listener because he's he's taking in information from gun work from us and, and really listening to the details. So props to Craig. Yeah. Uh, so first one, the Sammy print yet yeah, Hornady yep. factory match ammo is 10 foot per second higher. Yep. Uh, that's because we publish a muzzle velocity and the uh, specs Sammy. listed in Sammy are instrumental. Um, and as defined by Sammy, that's at 15 feet, I believe. So what you see there is the difference between the velocity of the bullet when it first comes out of the muzzle and, and it's lost, you know, so it's call it 10 foot per yeah. second by the time it's gone 10, 15 All right. feet. All right, that's range. something to take away for everybody listening, not just as it relates to this podcast, but that muzzle velocity at the muzzle mm -hmm. and then the Sammy stuff instrumental, instrumental, which is measured 15 feet from the muzzle. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then for those listening that don't really know what he's referencing, uh, I've talked a couple different times. I'm not sure which area he's pulling from, but um, that you can use the publicly available SAMI data on a cartridge to kind of keep yourself out of trouble pressure wise, you know, yeah. so you don't have load data available from a manual or whatever. You can go see, well, what's normal for a 308, 168 grain bullet out of a 308. And on the SAMI website, you can find that manual and it'll list, okay, this velocity is, you know, generally what you're going to get with this pressure. And, and those are generals too. They're not a, a right. hard, fast rule, but if you see that you're getting 200 foot per second more than what everybody at SAMI has agreed on is equal to this pressure, you might have some pressure going on. That's kind of what that's in reference to. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Gunworks video, that was years ago. Um, so a 225 ELDM at 2,900 foot per second out of a 26 and a half 300 PRC. Uh, so I could get that if I selected a type of propellant, like what we were addressing before, that had a higher energy content. So that means that um, uh, without generating higher pressure, it can push on the bullet longer. You could think of it as in very simple terms and results in higher velocity. Mm -hmm. uh, with that one, I'm not sure. Um, I Around that time... Was that's when we were messing with the longer barrel stuff, and I wonder if I didn't say a 36 inch barrel, maybe said 26 and screwed up or something. Because I, I know you guys have each done yardstick long 300 PRCs. But with my 36 inch PRC barrel, I was running 250 A tips at 20. It was 28 or 29. I don't remember. Yeah, we were low 29. 29s, I think. Yeah, 29, yeah. 20 or so. Um, so Out I don't know. I'd, I'd have to. I'd have to look there. But, and and likewise. Uh, but you're not that far off either. I mean, yeah. you, you figure. The 225 is running just over, uh, you know, 2,800 with a 24 inch, and so you tack another two and a half inches onto that, and yeah, you're, you're approaching 20. You're approaching it. And yeah. one thing I would mention, two things I would mention, but the first would be, factory ammunition is loaded conservatively. Yes, the max average pressure is 65,000 pounds. We'll typically load our ammo between 58 and 62, mm -hmm. and with where we work, you can pressure test your ammunition mm -hmm. and say this is 64,000 pound ammo and then go to a match knowing that your ammo is 64,000 pounds where you can flirt the line with the max average pressure because you, you I mean you have the pressure testing equipment so that's one leg up we we have over you know what I'm going to call the general consumer and then two the other thing your job as a senior ballistician and the ballistic development group as a whole is to play around and do research and development mm -hmm. and we get to use some of propellants that aren't commercially available mm -hmm. uh, to help, you know, or like you mentioned earlier, we work hand in hand with several propellant manufacturers. Yep. And we can test some things on their behalf and work with them to create some new things. And uh, that could have been an instance like that. Yeah. But the more I look at it, those numbers are right in there. I mean, 2,900 yeah. foot per second out of a 26 and a half inch barrel. <clears throat> yeah. You might have a little bit of 
you know, fouling that's uh, increasing the velocity there, but you're not far off of the realm of reason when you consider, you know, a, a 25 to 30 foot per second increase per inch of barrel length. You know, you add two and a half inches off of a 24 inch and you're right in there. So yeah. Yeah, 30 foot fast. Sometimes yeah. I don't remember okay. everything I said years ago. Yeah, uh, color me shocked, Jaden. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, and he said in here, I believe I read it, thanks for making the technical videos. And, Craig, appreciate you listening to them, and we're going to keep making them as long as you guys keep digesting them, listening to them, watching them, interacting with us. We, you know, we enjoy doing these type of videos. Uh, moving on to Peter Briggs. Peter says, please tell me how this relates to barrel harmonics and barrel timing. I'm going to use the wrong words here. But you seem to be saying that both barrel whip, meaning up and down, and the bore expansion with the shock wave, think OBT or optimal barrel time, aren't real effects on dispersion. Is this true? Any chance you could address these effects slash theories in a part three? So what he's saying, uh, are, we, are we implying that the uh, traditional nodes, harmonics, barrel whip, and uh, the bore expansion uh, aren't real effects on dispersion? No, not at all. I mean, it, it's, I think, irrefutable that those things are occurring. The question is, are they, like you said earlier, Miles, are, are you happening to time them perfectly in some narrow window of existence? I, I don't know. I don't, Probably I, not. I think you have a lot of other things going on um, that, are, that are eclipsing it. There's a lot of knobs that we know exist, probably a bunch more that we don't know exist, and a lot of the knobs that we know exist are really, really hard to directly correlate to what happens. Mm -hmm. And because it, it's hard to correlate a turn to that knob causes of an yeah. effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. because what's happening is happening very quickly, uh, very small magnitude of movement in terms of barrel swell or muzzle whip or whatever, um, and it's all behind an opaque steel wall. Yeah, yeah. And the... The highest correlation knob that I have ever seen is uh, charge weight with velocity and pressure. Obvious, right? Yeah. I put more charge, I put more powder in the case, and the velocity and the pressure go up. Even that's not a one to one. Yeah. You know how how can I have a higher charge weight with a velocity that ends up lower? You know when you do these little ladder test things, and you, I went up three tenths of a grain, and this shot was slower than the fastest <laughs> shot of the last one. Well, how's that work? Because it's not. It's yeah. Not a, not it's valid. Not one -to -one. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So moving on to Apex Knives. He says, Hornady Manufacturing, one criticism that I've heard from the bench rest and F-class shooters is that your test equipment is not as good as their custom actions, custom barrels, custom stocks, etc. Can someone please speak to this or maybe have a follow-up on this topic? Um, yeah, I'm go sure. Ahead. I'm sure they know exactly what we're using. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we're using... Top of the line, we're using what they're using. Single using. point cut rifled barrels yeah. and custom actions. I mean, and a lot of people seem to like um, position us in a uh, against the the bench rest and F class world, which is a bit crazy. We have a bench rest team. Yeah, um, we have some very high performing bench rest folks that shoot uh, at this company. So it's strange there. I, I think it's just the, the clashes of ego, you know. In yeah. my opinion, is what's going on. But yeah, I mean, our job is to make the best stuff out there. We 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 spend quite a bit of money in getting very good equipment and good systems. I mean, we're not yeah. uh, we're not playing in the in the noise of lack of quality when it comes to what we're testing with. A hundred percent. You, can, I mean, and yeah, custom actions, custom barrels, custom stock. What do they think we're using? Yeah, I don't. Right. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to argue with religion. Yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> we have the best Husqvarna actions that money can buy when we found a good, you know, good yeah. sale on Gunbroker. Yeah. That's right. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, we're yeah, quality is not a, a, a concern with us. Like we're we're buying the same equipment that they're buying as far as barrels and actions and stocks and all of that jazz. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, and like what that was like Joe's big deal for the longest time. Yeah, Our assistant director of engineering, the kind of the lead of the ballistic development group that he was a bench rest guy yeah, high performing yeah bench rest shooter, rest shooter of the years. year and and yeah like killing it yeah. figuratively speaking with all custom everything i think if you misinterpret the way we presented the data or the data itself you could see us trying it's not like i'm trying to attack anybody and say that 
no, you're not doing what you're doing. You're doing what you're doing. I'm just saying this is, I think a lot of people are looking at it uh, on a tarmac of a runway and looking at the little pebbles and bumps that make up, make up that, that surface and saying, oh, look at all these little bumps. You know, this thing isn't even at all. And if you step up two feet above the surface and you look out, it like, looks, yeah, this is incredibly flat. Yeah. Yeah. Good way to put it. Exactly. All right. Moving on to Dan Sprouse. Dan, he writes in, when discussing the hunting rifle and three shot groups, all at the same target, or is it seven different three shot groups? Jaden, how do you do it? When you're trying to get a 21 shot composite, um, are you shooting one point of aim, one point of impact, or are you shooting seven different three shot groups and then doing an overlay? I generally shoot seven different three shot groups um, because I don't want to to destroy my point of aim for one you know yeah. if your rifle's well zeroed and it's hitting where you're aiming shoot 21 shots and you're going to start to destroy the thing you were aiming at yeah uh, so that's problem number one uh and then problem number two is is if you have a, a good shooting system you start to lose each bullet hole you know you start to produce just a one wad, wad of yep. a group right it just cuts the paper out so you're mm -hmm. shooting a piece of paper and you can't distinguish where shot 15 went from where shot 18 mm -hmm. went um, so generally i do seven different points of aim um, but the important thing to keep in mind there is that I measure from the point of aim to each impact. And then when I go to my next one, I do the same thing. And then I composite all of those numbers. Where's the impact relative to the point, point of aim? aim. And yep. then that's how you can get your composite group. Yeah, my 21-shot yep. yep. composite. And as a corollary, what you another thing you can do, I don't know if you do do it, but uh, for the listener, if you're doing seven three-shot groups, you can get an average of what your three-shot group dispersion sure. is. Yeah. And we know that on a three shot group, you might have 60% bigger and smaller, but you can get an average accuracy expectation of what your rifle is going to do on a, on a three shot group, which, you know, might not be the end all say all, but it's certainly more information than you had before. That's right. So gleaning more information out of every shot. So miles, this next one's for you. I didn't read the whole thing, but I read the top couple lines here. It comes into us from Clayton McLeod. Clayton says, what increments did you use for testing seating depth? What if muzzle exit timing is very important in reducing dispersion, but your test methods skipped right over those areas where meaningful changes would have been seen? If you test in 15 thou increments, say, but you actually need to test in 3 thou increments in order to find those differences, how can you confidently say it doesn't really make any meaningful difference in dispersion? You say it doesn't as far as you saw, and that indeed may be true, but is it possible that your methodology caused you to miss something? Yeah. Sure. <coughs> I mean, aliasing is a thing. Yeah. It's, is it possible? Absolutely. Yeah. But the, the, the point of it was, this is still people, I think, getting lost in the fact that you're, you're not dealing with a stable set of results. So if you're telling me that I can make meaningful changes or that node concept, that node is going to be discovered by 3,000 iterations. So we know that having a statistically valid sample size, you know, starts around 20 and gets better as you go up from there. I'm not going to lay down and shoot 20 or 30 shot every 3,000. I mean, it's almost an unrealistic expectation. Maybe yeah. that's what you need to do to find the best load. Yeah. But when you find the best load, if your barrel is a, you know, roached at that point, it's no good anymore. Is that an effective means to doing it? I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, again, we're not saying that we know everything. We're saying we did this test and here's what happened. And we were putting that up against the mm -hmm. traditional dogma of, hey, when you turn this knob, this definitely happens. What we're saying is we turned that knob a bunch of times and it didn't happen every time. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. So Clayton goes on to write a, a big dissertation uh, about a bunch of things. Uh, uh, basically, you know, th when I read through this, it kind of reminded me of, of, uh, when Jaden, when you were on, uh, Eric Cortina's podcast, and that was a great podcast if, for the listeners out there who haven't checked that out, please jump over there and listen to that one. Um, but what he was saying was, uh, your testing methods, in his opinion, kind of excluded people's experience, mm -hmm. uh, f uh, for those shooters and those, you know, F class and, and bench rest type world. So, um, like I said, I don't, want to read this entire thing to anybody um, but uh, you guys have, have quickly read through it what are your thoughts 
Yeah, experience, I think you could view as sample size. You know, if you've been shooting this cartridge and this bullet and this powder over five different barrels, you're getting ready to start your sixth barrel and you you shoot five shot groups because you compete in a discipline that that's what you do. And you notice that you're shooting five shot groups that are repeatedly bigger than you've ever shot before. Yeah, there's probably something going on. That experience counts for something. Sure. You know, absolutely. Nobody's taking that away from anybody no. for sure. And And even if you... If you take the average of your five shot groups and you say, oh, this is a quarter minute gun. And I say, no, that's a half minute gun. It's the same gun. Yeah. It's, it's just it's semantics. how you define it. Yeah. 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 Again, you could, oh, I shot a five, five shot groups and they averaged a quarter minute. I have a shabadabadoo gun. Right. You, you don't even need the, the name. You don't even need yeah. to call it what, it, what the accuracy is. No, I, I think, I don't know. Cause you, you had that discussion with Eric and in my opinion, if I say this is a, quarter minute gun then it then you lay down and you shoot a five shot group and it never prints bigger than a quarter minute mm -hmm. that's my take on it yeah you're the lowest common denominator yeah okay I, worst day you know that everything is done correctly just the roll of the dice and the random five worst shots roll out of that gun of that load it should be a quarter, quarter minute, minute if it's a quarter minute gun mm -hmm. That's my take on it. That's maybe not yeah. the same. Maybe not everybody agrees with that. Right. It's, or, yeah, again, yeah. a lot of semantics. Yeah, but... Yeah, just give it the definition. So when I say, yeah, it's a half-minute gun, that means, like, four to, between four and six sigma, it's going to produce a half-minute or better mm -hmm. just about every shot. Yeah. Yep. And he, uh, uh, he kind of rounds this out here, talking about barrel vibration, and he is very adamant that uh, bullets exiting at a specific node is the uh the the pinnacle of precision um and that yeah we're we're missing that and we're doing the industry uh, an injustice by not pursuing um uh, bullet seating testing uh better so miles take that to uh, do yeah. more bullet seating well there's testing. a hole in the market for somebody to pick up there you go. Business opportunity, Clayton, <laughs> and or anybody else out there. Give the world what they need. Give the world what they need. Yeah, and right. hey, hey, gather the data. I mean, oh, we're not saying sure. our data is the only data that's relevant, you know, like that's yeah. ridiculous. I like, think we, we said that before recording that, hey, we, we're the smartest guys in the room and they're going to take this as gospel because we said so. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's yeah. crazy. I mean, and it's not like I'm done testing either. I mean, there's more stuff that we'll do and I'm sure there'll be more things that we find as we go along, but. Uh, yeah, well, and, and it's okay to be, to be critical and, and we're not. Oh, Oh, trying yeah, to slight yeah, yeah. Clayton. Uh, we also have jobs outside of this. Can you, we, Jaden and I have talked about this years ago. Can you imagine how it would be if we didn't have to worry about Miles designing a 90 grain, 9 millimeter hollow point? And Jaden didn't have to worry about uh, making the internal ballistics look really good on a 350 Legend or something. And if we could just solely focus on long range precision and how cool that would be in the ground we would cover. But we don't. We have to do the 350 Legend. We have to do the Bushmaster. You have to do bullet projects for pistols and revolvers and subsonic and all these other things. So the testing's ongoing. It's just yeah. it, that's only a sliver of your job responsibilities. Yep. But hey, if that matters, test it, get uh, good data. Let's yeah. see it. Yeah, I'd be yeah. interested to see. I Heck mean, yeah, I it, yeah, it's like I think I've nailed this to death. I hope. I and mean, he even mentioned it at the beginning of this that like that's that's the testing I did. That's what I've seen. I can't, I can't do everything. I don't have yeah. all the answers. Uh, but yeah, if you think that's correct, then prove it. Yeah, that right, right on. Or right. give me a link here to you know somebody that has. All right, we're moving on to a much better, uh, at least handle uh over to 18 wheels and a dozen six shooters all right <laughs> uh, i'm curious about your statement seating depth doesn't really matter i have to wonder if you're not seeing effects from seating depth due to the fact that you're using a truck axle for a barrel which is true a lot of our stuff's done only on. an 18 wheeler handle can uh, make yeah, that claim with yeah, truth. Right. that's awesome <laughs> does seating depth have a bigger effect on a pencil barrel Potentially. Probably. Potentially. Yeah. And I think to clarify, you know, he said your statement, seating depth doesn't really matter. To clarify that, I, I don't know the direct quote, but basically seating depth didn't really matter in our chamber designs with the reamers that we have with the bullet profiles, the OGI profiles on our bullets. So just, just to clarify that, because I think you did give that caveat that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. So there, there may be times. a super <laughs> steep hyper secant OGI and a really, really... Uh, 
loosely designed chamber that it it probably makes a huge difference. Who well, knows? Yeah. We'll if have to test it. If your barrel is the uh, wacky, uh, come on, help me out. Oh, um, inflatable wacky arm flailing tube man? Yes. If your barrel is him, then yeah, maybe when you maybe. give it a uh, different bullet jump, you, you aff- affect where he is yeah. pointing when your bullet And that's out. a tough one to test because you're you're going to have to deal with a lot of heat. Yeah, yeah so there's a time, lot of things. Yeah. There's so many you things going there's, on. Yeah, there's, it's really hard in this to change one thing and not change other things yep that's a good question though and yeah we do have it's uh, probably it's probably a factor um yeah and i think that's kind of like uh, there's some stuff that i was looking into the other day like um what do they call it structured barrels Mm -hmm. where they take just a giant barrel and they drill holes and and basically increase the the rigidity of of the structure for a given weight um and in doing that then you lower the amplitude of the vibrations that happen and theoretically that should that Should. should be better theoretically that's yeah i mean and there's a lot of like you know a lot of things that are theoretical and don't pan out too but yeah that may be one that that does i don't know all righty well haven't moving got on there yet the next question from dank sensi he says real question were you only using the factory loaded ammo in your testing models and if so how do you know that you weren't simply seeing the manufacturing variations in that ammo would you would a more precisely loaded ammo take smaller groups to get that same level of distribution where it took two boxes of factory ammo for the distribution to stabilize would a more precisely loaded ammo's distribution stabilize at say 20 rounds mm-hmm. so to that first question did you only use factory ammo no nope, no everything that was in that dispersion test was loaded to like 0.02 yeah. grains aside from the test where you hand charged yeah, it. yeah well yeah so but all of the Ladder seating depth test, that was all loaded to 0.02 grains. Then from there, I went and did a bunch of hand-thrown charges versus weighed to the kernel. And then I did uh, all the seating depth stuff was was also done with weighted to 0.2 grains. Then there was like sorting by volume of the case. uh, Primer weight. Yeah, sorting primer. primers, uh, primer brands. Um, lar- I know you've shot a bunch of factory ammo too. Yeah, large sam- or large primer pocket, small primer pocket whatever there's yeah. been a bunch of little sidebar things that have gone on shooter versus accuracy rest uh yeah factory ammo versus hand loads of the same components so for long answer short uh it, yes it, we've it, isolated everything that i had could yeah. think of to isolate and it took it takes the 30 shots to stabilize and it only gets better yeah, from there. Yeah, yeah his his use of the word distribution is critical there that i think what he's saying is it is a gun that that shoots a smaller level of dispersion can you shoot less of those and get a good picture of what the gun yeah. does mm, maybe the distribution is 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 still susceptible to the same sample size to be valid it's just that it's a smaller net result okay. but but the the way the distribution forms is tied to that sample size you got to have that number of shots yeah got it all right yeah the more shots that you put into it and it remains a very good shooting group then the higher your confidence interval, or your, your higher confidence is that it, it will continue to do that into the future. Yeah. Um, but just because three rounds stack into the same hole doesn't mean that the next three aren't going to go minute and a half. Right. Just because the first three rounds stack in the same hole doesn't mean that the next 30 won't either. It's, right. Yeah, you just got to. You don't know. You don't know until you shoot all the shots. Got to right. keep going. All right. So moving on to a question from Just Snuggle. He says, uh, talking about group shape, agreed in a test barrel, it would be a round group, but most of us are shooting barrels that have harmonics. So wouldn't that account for the vertical dispersion more than loose fixtures? Not in my experience. Um, So loose fixtures is where I most commonly see it. So loose barrel to action, loose Mm. action to stock, loose scope to action are the common areas there. Loose suppressor, yeah. Uh, loose muzzle brake, whatever. Um, no, if if every time that we've shot a group and we start to see it like string, it has some linearity to it. As you continue to fire and get your sample size higher, that thing populates. Now, I will say, if I see that early on in the sample size, like if it's strung vertically an inch and a half by the seventh round, and I'm looking for levels of dispersion that are less than an inch and a half, you might as well stop. Yeah, like you're, you're already, already getting better than that. Right. Yeah. Now, especially go back, check your fixture, make sure everything's tight. But, I mean, we've shot, we shot those 500-shot um, groups. And the group, by the time we got to 50 shots, it was round. And it only 
stayed round and just got more filled in. You yeah. know, it, it, most of the time when you see the stringing, be careful about associating a problem to it that you can't prove. And if you then, you know, let's say you see the stringing by the seventh shot and you keep shooting and it stays strung when you get to like 20 or 30, there's probably something going on. Is it harmonics? I don't know. Maybe. Probably yeah. has a contributing factor. Yeah. But Miles, you were thinking something deep. Yeah, I lost it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just be careful about associating things. Oh, I know this is that. Like yeah. the worst of the, the use of that word no is very important. Fair enough. All right, a question in from Russell Deering. He says, guys, I completely understand the maths, and obviously the more input, the better output. I also agree with everything that you're saying, but am I missing something? I really can't see that this changes anything. The Scott Satterley method or the ladder test are still going to show what made up round is better or worse, and there isn't a half-minute gun. Okay, cool, there's no half-minute gun, but there is is a tighter and a looser version of that gun. Are we not moving the goal posts a bit here and still carrying on as normal? Would love help on this. So he's saying, uh, what am I missing? That our low development methods and the large sample size testing that we found, uh, doesn't that not change anything? Because the Scott Satterley method or the ladder test method are still going to show uh, what round is better or worse. If you do and them if, enough times, it yeah, will. Yeah, it's inefficient, I guess. That's, that's my point in pushing to try 20 rounds, to try 10 or 20 rounds instead of threes and fives or ones is mm -hmm. because to, to do, to get the sample size with a big group of average data of mm -hmm. small shot groups is inefficient. You're going to, you're going to end up with the same or less information after having shot the same or more rounds. If that makes sense, yeah. Where you can twenty to thirty shots of of a variable of a you know of a single load, you can define the complete. You can pretty much have a really really good picture of the dispersion profile of that combination. Where if you do, where if you just spot check it with your five shotters or your three shotters or your one shot Satterley test, then you don't know. Yeah. Really, like, and then if you end up somewhere and you think, "Oh, I got the magic combination here," and then you shoot twenty or thirty of them, and it was the same as if you just randomly grabbed you know, a good powder with a good bullet and shot twenty or thirty right out of the gate, you just did all that load test for nothing. Yeah, it was very inefficient, like you said. Yeah, yeah. If um, the, if the question is which one is the best, if that's your goal in it, it's not an efficient way to do it. Yeah. Um, and is it yeah. moving the goalposts? Mm, no. no. Well, and that was the other thing. And I if think anything, I it's moving them closer to yeah. you. Yeah. Just Shoot. below that is my reply to that. But I never said I haven't seen a half minute gun. I've made, oh, yeah. yeah. Let's be clear about that. Yeah. Half minute all the time. Yeah. That's doable. You can do that. There's a lot of people that are in that ballpark. Um, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7. I'd say 0. 0.4 to 0. 0.7. There's a lot of competent reloaders and match shooters of several disciplines that are in that world. Mm -hmm. um, it's the quarter minute stuff that I've. We've never seen it like a true quarter minute, like slinging them into the same hole, you know, like yeah, every time. Seen. Cool. If you got it, I'd, I'd love to see it. I'd love to know how you I, got yeah, there. I want one, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, just, uh, that's part of the, like the being realistic. And then a lot of guys fool themselves into thinking, oh, well, yeah, this is half minute all the time. And then when you put them down and you say, okay, here, here's two boxes, shoot two 20 shot groups, let it, let it cool off as you need to, whatever. Here's, you know, in the tunnel, no wind, no sun dial, you know, whatever, nothing's goofing you. Mm -hmm. Right. And time and time again, it's better part of a minute of angle rifle when before they thought, Oh, well, I got a half minute all day long. This is, this is a dialed in, trued up. This is a rig that I'm, yeah. you know, I'm competitive with, you know, whatever. And you're still competitive depending on the discipline, but it's not the same level that you thought it was just yeah. because you got misled by the trend, the statistical trend that small data sets will look better than what the total data set yeah. actually is. Yep. And you could have That's had a whole half point minute of all gun yeah. if you just did your part. All day long. <laughs> <laughs> that critical piece. <laughs> <laughs> All but right. It's a, yeah, I think I think a lot of people get lost on this. We're not saying that anything's any different than it ever was. It's you just need to open your eyes and it's a matter of perspective. A lot yeah. of people are this high off the ground, looking at the ground, and if you just come up to here the whole world kind of levels out. Now I'm not saying go out into outer space and it's all the same. Everything doesn't matter. Cause, yeah. Cause you know, it, that's life not true is meaningless, all. you know, but yeah. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> but yeah, but, but there's, there's a happy ground in between there where you can not worry about every little 
speck of sand bump on that asphalt and mm-hmm. and you can say oh yeah no this is this is that this is that uh that's a, that's acceptable this is like this is what actually really happens and just back it off a little bit and yeah. and the whole world gets a little bit simpler that's amazing yeah. guys i don't have any more questions for you but i do have uh one last comment from schnick who replied uh to us on the youtubes he says they're laughing at you on the Facebook groups. Just saying. I don't, I don't have Facebook. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If I had a dollar for every time somebody laughed at me, man. Yeah. Uh, lols. Uh, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Laughing at you on the Facebook groups. I would say good. Uh, it, it, it obviously struck a nerve with people, and there's going to be some people that have a hard time checking the ego and, and that's whatever. But there's going to be some of those people that join in with the, the laughing at whatever. But you know their wheels are turning. And they're, they're going to go, yeah, wait a minute. What, maybe, I sh- maybe just for laughs, I'll try it just one time. And, and start to, like you said, Miles, just kind of change their perspective by getting a, a better reference of, of their sport. And, yeah. and trying to be, yeah, we're, we're not, uh, we talked about the tinfoil hat thing. Like trying to uh, trick people into shooting more bullets so we can make more money (laughs) (laughs) but just shoot a little bit more at the beginning so you don't have to shoot more or scratch your head more later on yeah we're trying to save you trouble um save you money save you time and save you effort to counter the facebook laugh or whatever that means uh we've had a lot of people that wrote in and said hey i tried that out and wow it did what you said it would do like i had these couple tiny little three shotters and when i went to fives they got bigger and tens and twenties and like yeah my my rifle is still an awesome rifle. It shoots really well, but it's not as, it's not yeah. quite what I thought it was before. And this will help me moving forward because I have a realistic expectation of what it can do now. So I'm not going to, yep. I'm not going to freak out when it doesn't do what I thought it was supposed to do. Yeah. Um, so. And I, I don't, I mean, I know you've seen it and I'm sure you've seen it at matches guys where that one, that one round, the low, I mean, it's a low probability out there on the edges of the distribution, but they'll go somewhere and it's like some people wheels fall off. Don't know how to handle that. No. Nope. And like, man, should I adjust this? Should I? Well, do now it? they're digging in their Kestrel oh, yeah. and they're using and like the in between, you know, the upset, disgruntled, you know, like what if? Yeah. We, you know, they're, they're yeah. on the on the ballistic uh, calculator using BC and they're fudging BCs and fudging muzzle velocities and just going crazy and changing dope in between stages yeah. and stuff. I better knock like, a tenth off of everything from here on out. It's like, whoa, guys, whoa, just yeah. Like, and we've all been that guy. Yeah. Like I've been that guy. Yeah. Long time ago. And so we're just trying to pass on some lessons we've learned through our journey. You know, we yep, got a, yep. we got a ton left to learn for sure. Yep. But so, um, so guys, I appreciate you uh, uh, answering some of these questions. I know this has been kind of a long podcast, but uh, I didn't con- uh, confer with you guys on this before the show. But to end on a high note, uh, uh, winner of the best handle and virtual fist bump goes out to eighteen wheels and a dozen six shooters. <laughs> uh, you're the winner of the best handle, um, guys. If there's more questions. Just get them to us, podcast at hornady.com. Drop them in a comment on this video or any other of our YouTube videos for our podcast. And we like going through these, and we'd love to hear what you guys want to hear more. So with that, Jaden, Miles, you got anything else for them? Well, thanks for the support and, and the, all the listeners that have wrote in. It's great to hear back from you. Again, I don't think I know it all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but you do have a great mustache, so I mean, kind of... <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks again, everybody out there. Hopefully you took away uh, some good stuff from this one. We'll catch you guys on the next one.